I don't see this approach. I don't see what I'm saying as being a kumbaya or be moderate. Um, okay. And I do think that I do think that both of the things you said, Gene, are common assumptions about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think the way some hard conversations end up turning out is they look kumbaya -y because they're being pretty avoidant about the hard differences. Um, or they look moderate because people are toning down what they actually think, feel, or how they see the world. Um, so what I think this really is, is actually leaning into the conflict more, leaning into the differences. Um, and that's what makes it uncomfortable, right? That's what makes it hard. Um, and some of these differences, right, they're not, we're not going to agree. And we actually might feel, um, we might come away from that conversation feeling even more strongly about our own view. But I think we also come away thinking differently about the other person. That is to say that um, it's harder to turn them into like a cartoon character. It's harder to turn them into kind of a uni unidimensional simpleton. And I think that that's what our country really needs right now. You know, you don't really know who you are or what you are until you put a really big challenge in front of you. Fear is an asset and ally here to help you be magnificent. This crazy, silly, stupid idea to run across the Sahara Desert. You did make it this time, but you said if you didn't make it, you would try again and again. Everybody's connected to nature, connected to music, to their families, and now we're going to build a world that doesn't have racism and war and starving kids. I kept telling myself, run at me, and just keep smiling. Bob, thanks again. Part two. I got to tell you, um, the last interview that we did just a couple weeks ago, we got such amazing feedback on it that I wanted to make sure that we got part two in right away because obviously we're going through some very difficult national conversations right now. You could, you know, there's a lot to choose from there. But um, so I felt like we could continue from where, maybe not where we left off, but we talked a lot about, um, you know, the ground rules for having an uncomfortable conversation. Um, but I thought maybe we could start today by talking about, you know, what the purpose of having an uncomfortable conversation should be and how we can, you know, try to reorient ourselves towards whatever that purpose. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Great. Well, Gene, thanks for having me back. And oh, yeah, uh, you bet. <laughs> yeah, I'm really <laughs> so far. <laughs> I'm, I'm delighted. To, I'm delighted to hear that uh, there is a lot of feedback um, and enthusiasm to hear some more because I think, I think yeah. as a country and as individuals, we certainly need more of these uncomfortable conversations. So yeah, with respect to um, the purpose, um, I think the purpose has to be, if they're going to succeed, um, to learn. Um, so I think if the purpose is to persuade, if the purpose is to convince, uh, if the purpose is to win, I think they're going to fail. Um, so I think the purpose has to be they're this, this person or this set of people on the other side of an issue where something seems really clear and evident to me. And it clearly doesn't seem that way to them. And so I want to try to understand how they see it that way. Um, and that's going to be hard because there's going to be a lot of times when I want to tell them they're wrong. Um, when I'm no longer curious to hear any more about them because I think they are, and you could fill in the blank, you know, racist, a bigot, sexist, or, you know, captured by the liberal left, um, brainwashed by the media. And, um, but I think the notion is that we have to be curious and learn more. So I think that, that's like a really big purpose. I think once you have that purpose, then any other number, other purposes are also can be appropriate, right? So it could be to build a further connection. It could be to bridge a gap. It could be to 
Um, maybe just problem solve around a set of issues that we have to figure out. We might not agree on three major issues, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there's six other issues that need to be resolved where if we can't work with each other on it, we're not going to resolve it. But so maybe just to like push back isn't the right word, but maybe explore that a little bit further. Like what's the purpose of learning? Is the purpose of learning, like, because I go into this and like my instinct because I want to persuade. Yeah. And so I want to learn what, the way that you feel so that I can <laughs> more effectively persuade you. Um, so I feel like disingenuous, like going into a conversation that's like, let me, you know, I'm, I want to learn and understand how you feel and why you feel this way. And that's it. Because like, you know, I ultimately do want to persuade you that, you know, maybe the way that you're thinking about this issue is wrong. Or maybe, you know, yeah. I should be open to like, understanding why I'm wrong. So I got to leave myself open to that. Um, but like you said, like, the, I guess the deeper, like to build a bridge, isn't to building a bridge trying to bring us closer together, which is in some way about persuasion? Yeah, so I think that there can be a whole host of subsidiary purposes. Um, but I think the first pur purpose, like on your list, has to be to learn. Um, because I think that, and this is the problem with, I think, people who, I mean, the reason why I came to be interested in hard conversations is my original interest was in negotiation. It was in mm -hmm. how do I persuade people? And I thought, oh, the way you persuade people is by getting a lot of data, is by coming up with really tight arguments, is by showing them evidence, is by getting more kind of leverage and power. And I think what I learned is, you know, sometimes all those things can work, but it's actually not they're not really particularly effective. Um, I think actually the way you learn, uh, by the, sorry, the way you persuade is first by making the other person feel heard and valued and seen. And secondly, by actually learning about what they see as persuasive, what they see as important what they see as the levers that help them form their decisions and views of the world. Um, because that then allows us, if, if your purpose is to persuade, it allows you to know how you could be persuasive instead of making assumptions about what would be persuasive. Um, but right, I guess- but then, like it's, but then it's almost like a, somewhat of a flawed um, premise on which you're having the or disingenuous premise on which you're having a conversation because I'm coming in saying oh I just want to learn I want to learn but really in the back of my mind it's because I want to figure out the way to persuade you yeah well that yeah I hear that um and I think that the I think the the challenge there right is that if you really really want to learn um I think you're going to be much more effect, and and maybe a subsidiary purpose is to persuade at some point. Um, but I think the learning interest has to come first, because if you're learning just for the purpose of persuasion, you're going to close off a whole bunch of avenues um, that a might be actually persuasive, but b actually might change the way you see the situation. Um, and I think part of part of what's tough if of your first per purpose is to persuade. Um, and not to learn is that you shield yourself off from the possibility that you might be wrong or not even wrong, just that you haven't seen the whole picture. Um, and so maybe, maybe I could, you know, put a little asterisk to the purpose, right? Um, because it's, it's to learning, but part of it is also, you know, this opportunity to both share your view, but also to make yourself a little bit vulnerable. Like a, a hard or uncomfortable conversation doesn't work if you're not prepared to be a little bit more vulnerable yourself. Mm. Interesting. Is this like, you know, with everything that's going on in the country, I guess you, there's ex could be examples on both sides of it's, it, this seems to be like an inherently kumbaya type of a framework or idea. 
And as divided as, and as heated as people are right now, if they're not interested in kumbaya at the moment, if they're not, it seems like a very moderate way of, and, re, and kind of like even keeled way of approaching a conflict. But people, you know, a lot of times aren't really looking for that kind of moderate, even keeled way of approaching a conflict. They want to fight. So how do you, how do you get to, you know, get to that middle place where people are willing and ready to have an uncomfortable conversation and actually learn about each other? Yeah, great question. Um, because you allow me to kind of clarify a little bit. I don't see this approach. I don't see what I'm saying as being a kumbaya or be moderate. Um, okay. And I do think that I do think that both of the things you said, Gene, are common assumptions about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I think the way some hard conversations end up turning out is they look kumbaya -y because they're being pretty avoidant about the hard differences. Um, or they look moderate because people are toning down what they actually think, feel, or how they see the world. Um, so what I think this really is, is actually leaning into the conflict more, leaning into the differences. Um, and that's what makes it uncomfortable, right? That's what makes it hard. Um, and some of these differences, right, they're not, we're not going to agree. And we actually might feel, um, we might come away from that conversation feeling even more strongly about our own view. But I think we also come away thinking differently about the other person. That is to say that, um, it's harder to turn them into like a cartoon character. It's harder to turn them into kind of a unidimensional uni simpleton. And I think that that's what our country really needs right now. Right now, I would say on both sides of the political fence, there is this way that we really quickly villainize people who aren't on, you know, aren't on board with the way we see it. Um, whether we characterize them as, you know, being suckers to fake news um, or being captured by, you know, a liberal coastal, you know, left, um, or whether we um, characterize them as, you know, simpletons, uneducated, um, not woke enough. Um, even, you know, even in, within, like, um, kind of sometimes shared political views, we see this tendency toward, you know, a cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, I thought you were on my side, but now that you did this or said this thing that I don't agree with, I'm done with you. Um, and I think that's not courageous. That's not um, being to me like a, a, a real advocate. That's just exit, exiting stage left. Mm -hmm. um, people who stay yeah, in them. Yeah, that's what ahead. I mean. Like, you have this kind of cancel culture on both sides, where it's just like, you know, if you're not woke enough, you're not woke enough. And if you're not like MAGA enough, you're not MAGA enough. And like, but then I think most people are probably moderate and in the middle. But our conversation, like, if you open the newspaper or the news or anything online, it seems like the conversation is just being had at the extremes. And, like, so how do you say, you know, to somebody who's, you know, to whom you're not woke enough, like, how do you, ha how do you kind of, or how do we kind of like bring it back into like more of being able to have an uncomfortable conversation? Yeah. So I, like, I remember you know, like when we were, when I was in law school with you, like it was 9-11. It was like our, my first week of law school. And so like everything was through that prism. And I just remember almost having an identical conversation with you. Like, how do you negotiate or have an uncomfortable conversation with the Taliban right so maybe that like like how do you do that right well I think that I mean the Taliban arguably is a different kind of a conversation yeah I know um, there's a lot of differences there but that <laughs> I want to I want to hold back from yeah but I, but I do think right that the fact that we're even making a comparison between the different views that we would have internally politically in the United States and the Taliban is kind of interesting 
Um, but I would, I'll, I'll make this comparison. How, you know, there's a distinction I would say between having a difficult conversation with the Taliban as an organization, then there might be with having a one-on-one con a -on -one conversation with someone who is a member of the Taliban. Uh, because in, 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 in both cases, I think um, part of it is the, if, if people are doing things that I think of as completely evil and wrong, they could in fact be completely evil and wrong. Um, or it could be the case that from their worldview, from the way they see things, what they're doing has a legitimate and grounded purpose and reasoning to it. And without justifying their behavior, if I wanna be effective in the world, um, and if I'm really interested in, and you could fill in the blank, building a better community, building a better company, building a better stable world, if you're at the mm -hmm. national level, um, it would be to my benefit to understand how their thinking is such that they think that something that I think makes no sense is the right thing to do. At the end of that conversation, I could decide, you know what, I think they're evil. <laughs> or I could decide, I see what, like the logic of what they're doing. I still think what, what the thing it is, is inexcusable. But now that I understand what's driving that behavior, I wonder if there's some things that I could do or that we can do to meet their underlying interests or to um, shift the way they see it so that they don't do this thing, um, that they change their behavior. You know, I mean, I think that like from my, my perspective, right, I'm, I'm at this moment, uh, I'm finding it really perplexing how people see wearing a mask in public places mm -hmm. as something that infringes on their liberty. And I would really welcome a conversation, like a genuine conversation with someone who sees it that way. Um, because I struggle with that, right? I don't, I don't see that. Instead, I see it, I see it as a common courtesy, um, not unlike the way we would, you know, ask you to wash your hands if you're a food server before you serve the food. Mm -hmm. um, or the way we would, you know, expect you to, I don't know, we, we expect you to wear pants or shorts or, you know, some kind of clothing in public. We don't just say, you should, you should walk around naked because where, you know, you can walk around naked because putting on a pair of pants infringes your liberty. So I well, struggle. I mean, it kind of does, but, um, <laughs> But, so how but everybody you agrees, but everybody <laughs> agrees have, to do it. How right? would you have your, how would you have that conversation with somebody who, you know, feels that a mask is infringing on their freedom? Yeah. I mean, I think I would start by just asking how that, why, like, how do they see it that way? Like, help me understand. Is there a specific way? Isn't that like kind of a rhetorical question though? Like, how would you, in a way that like, how could you possibly see it that way? It kind of puts me on the defensive. If. Yeah, I think I, I think you can't say it the way that, that, that you can't say how could you possibly see it that way. I think the way you would say it is, um, you know, I'm really struggling to understand how people see this connection or perhaps how you see this connection. And I'm wondering whether you'd be willing to spend some time just sharing with me what you're thinking it is on it and how it connects to it an impingement on your autonomy, would you be willing to do that with me? Have you had that conversation with anybody? No, but I, frankly, I'm not sure I personally know anybody who feels that way, <laughs> which is well, that, honestly one of the problems we have currently, I think in our culture that I think we also have to really try to address. Not, I mean, not specifically around face masks, 
but but around um, the sense that most of our most of people who I think at least people I know who they're friends with it's not that they have not that they see everything exactly the same of course um, but that around some of the big issues there's a um, a large sense of agreement and then I think what happens, right, and we know this from social psychological research, is that group dynamics, when we're in group dynamics, people tend to reinforce their per negative perceptions of the other. Um, and so thinking about how can we create, how can we identify people with the different views and then create spaces to actually have conversations with these people, um, I think can be a real social value and it's a social and, and it's something that in an earlier day arguably just necessarily had to happen because when we were geographically constrained um, and we didn't have the benefit of Facebook, Twitter, right. Instagram, et cetera, um, you were stuck with just the people who lived in your town. Right. And now we're not anymore. Um, and we kind of make these bubbles that just, where we don't have to engage the other side. Yeah, and I wouldn't even say, like, I mean, some of them are really intentional. Um, and some of them like are, I think, a product of a whole bunch of things that happened over a whole, like a long period of time. So whether it's like racial segregation and socio socioeconomic differences mm -hmm. that uh, that cause people to you know live in certain places and go to certain schools and and um, and we just find ourselves in these echo chambers and I think this is one of the things that is really really dangerous in the moment. It's how do we break out of the echo chambers, and that takes actual effort because it's often not the case that we readily have available a whole bunch of people that we feel like we could easily engage the hard conversation on who disagree with us well maybe i could find someone for you that thinks that the mask is infringing on their freedom and then you could you could do a little case study for us on how that conversation goes i mean that'd be fun i just because i'd be so curious to understand it right i'd be so curious to to know how they see it um and 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 part of like part of what i would be really curious about is um really like to what extent are there some real deep actual fears about that and to what extent is that a function of people being told that that's something they should worry about. You know, in negotiation, we talk a lot about slippery slope arguments as a barrier yeah. to negotiated agreement. I wanted to get here with you. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, and this could be a slippery slope argument, right? Which we see on, again, all sides of the political fence. Um, but this could be an example of that. First, it's these. You know, people might say there's nothing wrong with face masks. But the next thing you know, they're going to tell me, but you know, I have to do something else. And the next thing I have to do something else. Like I don't know. I don't know if you remember. Because no, you're too young to remember. But but years ago, because I was probably maybe in like eighth grade. I can't remember how old I was. But when they first started to have mandatory seatbelt laws. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember there was a whole movement saying, like, this is a real infringement on individual liberty. Um, you know, or motorcycle helmet belts, laws. Or motorcycle helmet laws. Which people, and people still say these things, right? Um, I mean, and what's interesting is, like, on the one hand, that's true, right? And then where, you know, where does the line start to get drawn is an interesting one. On the other hand, it may also be the case that that conversation at least allows us to know like where lines get drawn and what the reasoning is. Um, so, you know, I would feel like there's a distinction between a seatbelt or a helmet um, and a face mask. Um, a face mask is about protecting other people. A helmet is about protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and well, it's interesting. So there's so many different things that uh, you make me think of there. Um, and I want to come back to the idea of the slippery slope. I just more conceptually because I'm not sure if you remember, but like back when I was in law school and you were my advisor, like that, I remember you were studying that. And like I was doing yeah, up and doing research on that yeah. topic. Yeah, I did. So like I'm very interested in like you know where you went with that after I graduated and what you've learned you know, about slippery slope stuff. But on that, like what you brought up just now was like, that's a very rational argument. Like you can, you know, slice the salami. Say there's a difference between a face mask and a helmet. This is, this is like, you know, drunk driving laws. This is about protecting other people, not about yourself. But really it's not the logic that is, I think, in a lot of cases, motivating people. It's, it's more of like an underlying fear that they don't want, you know, you, Ivy League, you know, Northeast liberal coming in and telling me what to do. Yeah. It's more, more of like a, a gut fear and not about the logic of the argument. Yeah. Yeah. So that, but that's, what's so great about the conversation. Right. Cause I mean, if someone says that, right. I think I'd be like, wow, like I want to hear about those fears. Like, like there's a lot of, you know, what you're saying is there's like, some some something that's less about um data or facts and more about an interest in you know personal autonomy and and the way you phrased it um particularly some concern about you know whatever northeast liberals or ivy league liberals telling mm -hmm. other people what to do and so i would hear that as some experience or some story or both that this other person has of being kind of of being harmed or their family being harmed and that might lead to a really different conversation that might lead to you know my my mom's business got closed down because under the obama administration they put in a whole bunch of regulations around you know from the environment from osha around and you know environmental cleanliness that raised the cost of doing business such to the point that my mother couldn't do the business anymore or requirements around minimum wages and health care uh, meant that my mom's business and the eight workers and all the things that happened like shut down mm -hmm. well that like hearing that like if i if you're on the i, I just made obviously made that whole story yeah. up right? right but if you're on the other side of that conversation does that change your view on face masks probably not does that make you like come away with thinking like this is not some evil bad person who's nuts about not wearing a face mask right it's a it's a story of a person who's experience some actual harm um, in a really meaningful way in their family at the hands of um, what they see as, as also see as, as unidimensional, far off, like pointy headed bureaucrats in New York or Washington or Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> Like that makes me think totally different about that person. And what I would hope is that in part of the conversation, they would be able to, we would be able to access or uh, I'd be able to tell a story or do something for them that they came away thinking, okay, like, you know, Bob's a little bit pie in the sky. He spent too many time, too much time in, in a university, but I, he wasn't like, he wasn't all the horrific set of things that I thought he was. And we come out of the conversation, I just think with um, more of a sense of like, kind of mutual care, more of a sense of these issues are more complicated than they seem. Um, you know, I would come away on my side with an idea that policy making that sounds good in the aggregate or abstract um, actually can be really like hurtful in certain situations and therefore before we make those policies 
we need to do a lot more listening and thinking instead of just running numbers, you know, at the Brookings Institution. And I hope that, you know, people on the other side will come away thinking, like, yeah, just in a more kind of sympathetic and complex way about. Yeah, um, but not only, I mean, yeah. that's giving a little bit too much credit to people that people are going to think in a complex way, I think anyway. I mean, in the conversation, it's, it's funny because like, I remember like, you know, being so academic about this and you know, back when I was studying it, it was like, oh, you have to separate interests from positions and there's two sisters and they each are fighting over an orange. And, you know, it just, it turned out that, you know, one of them wanted the, 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 the fruit of the orange to make juice and the other wanted the skin of the orange to make a cake. So once they talked about why they wanted the orange, they were able to get through it. And, you know, instead of fighting over their position, it was just like, well, a lot of times you just get into the conversation and it, there is not like a real there is not that story there about their mother being having to lay off her workers because of an OSHA regulation. It's, you know, maybe it's like just like another, I'm, I have a hard time like figuring out where it comes from. Yeah, sometimes there I is mean, that story, but like sometimes there's not that story. It's just what they've been told, you know, that they have, that the government is going to get you. Yeah. But then, but even if they said that, right. right? So that's interesting. So it sounds like, you know, part of where this comes from is kind of a narrative that goes back a long time that the government's going to get you. Like, I want to hear about that. Where does that narrative come from? Interesting. So let's talk about slippery slopes. I see this coming up a lot. Now. <laughs> okay. And I. And but here's the thing, guys. Before people... before we go to slippery slopes, though, I just want to say, like, this is the point, right? It's not like I agree with Eugene. Like, not. The story of the orange and the two sisters is a, is a very simple story to il illustrate an important point. Uh, right. And by the way, even if that only worked for 15% of the time, that's 15%, which I think is a, you know, a low ball. Yeah. Um, that's like 15% of the time better than battle. Sure. Um, but like, I do think, right, the, the, the hanging in there, and when someone just says, I don't know, that's just what I've always been taught. Like on my side of that, like that's a gold, like, wow, it's what you've always been taught. And of course that matters to you. I wanna hear about the things you've been taught. So it just opens up more conversation, but okay, so, let's go. So, just, so before we get to the slippery slope on that though, there's, I'm not gonna verbalize this in the right way because I haven't, it's, it's still percolating in my head, but yeah. isn't that somewhat patronizing? Like, it's pa yeah. So, and in, a, in the sense that it's patronizing, like it almost would also put the other person on the defensive. Because it seems like so patronizing to me, like, oh, I just want to hear about you. I want to understand you better. And it's like, you, and I'm, now I'm just like putting myself into the, some of the shoes of the people who I feel like I've done this to. And like yeah. I've seen their reaction, right? They just like, here they go. Gene with his freaking negotiation, conflict management, conflict. I guess, and we could talk about conflict resilience and whatever the new ways that they're talking about it are. Like, it's just so, it, I can see like the look on their face that they feel like I'm patronizing them. Yeah. Okay. So, two things, right? So, I mean, you know, I think that if it isn't done with the right tone and with the genuine curiosity, it will be and feel patronizing. Um, on the other hand, I think if it's done with a real sense of curiosity and openness, I don't think it comes across that way. But here's the thing. If I see the eye roll or if I see the, uh, you know, frustration, I would just say like, okay, like, I think it sounds like, it seems like you're skeptical about my interest here. Like, call it out. It seems like you're skeptical about my <laughs> desire to like, yeah. that. like, let's hear that, right? And they're like, no, 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 it's not that. It's just, this is ridiculous. All right, what's ridiculous about it? Like, do you just stay in there? And if they don't want to do it, I mean, listen, this is not, there's nothing foolproof here. Right, But sure. You know who I would look to? Like, um, uh, if you think about who are some of the best, in my mind, very best interviewers. Um, like, so someone like, um, uh, oh my gosh, now I'm having, um, uh, Terry Gross on Fresh Air. Right. 
<laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> because that's like you couldn't have named like a more like Cambridge, New York, Northeast <laughs> liberal fanboy person that you could have named. Like <laughs> <laughs> but the thing about Terry Gross, right, is that I mean she has this way of like um, I think communicating a lot of curiosity uh, on or across a range of different people. And I don't think people feel I mean, condescended by her. I think they're like, they, she just gets people to talk a lot. Or Krista yeah. Tippett. She just gets people to talk a lot. Or Joe Rogan, I guess, is like kind of a more modern day. Version yeah. Of that. I mean, I think you're highlighting this something, Gene, which is an interesting, an interesting thought which is, um, I don't know if you mean to be doing this, but- Probably not. Like I'm but, not. <laughs> but I would say- <laughs> uh, to do it. I would say that I, I feel like just your reaction to Terry Grossing, that, that there is a distinction, I think, between a style of having these conversations and the stance you have toward it. So that is to say, I do, I do agree with you that um, there's a certain kind of, style in a Terry Gross that has this um, kind of air of like intellectual um, that, you know, you um, kind of softness. Um, and, and a style, I think there are styles that can be kind of more kind of hard hitting mm -hmm. and a little less of that. But I think there's a stance difference about am I here genuinely to learn or am I here to prove you wrong? And, you know, I think about, I'm trying to think about kind of prominent people who I would think are good at that, who genuinely are curious but might have a more um, challenging or hard edged stance. Um, I think about, I can think about some people, but their names, they're not popular names. They're names of people like through my work with Seeds of Peace that I feel like right. their style is a tougher style, but the stance of curiosity is the same. Interesting. Well, I'm going to think a little bit more about that. Yeah, please. My wife and I argue about Joe Rogan a lot. Sometimes I think he gets there. Sometimes I think he's off the deep end, but I think it's interesting how we can have a lot of people on that are very different, totally different people and just like have a, make everybody feel really at ease and comfortable. And, but anyway, um, yeah. slippery slopes. Yeah. Very interested in this. Cause like, I remember studying this with you and researching it with you and I, you know, I see it coming up a lot now, especially on things like the statues and removing yeah. the monuments. Yeah. And people will say like, where does it end? Like, all right, so we're going to get rid of the Robert E. Lee statue, but like, does that mean that you're also going to take down Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and yeah, or they say, you know, things like that, it keeps coming up. And so I'm wondering, or other things like the face mask. So you make me wear a face mask now. What does it mean that you're going to do tomorrow? Or, um, you know, there's lots yeah. of them that you could think yeah. about. So like, how, yeah. do you, how do you approach a slip? What are, the, what are your ideas around how to think about these slippery slope concerns yeah. and what to yeah. do to get, kind of get around them or yeah. to deal with them. Yeah, great question. So I feel like the first piece of this is just acknowledging um, having the one side say, okay, I can imagine taking down Robert E. Lee, but now we're on a slippery slope is actual progress. Because I think the first thing is to, um, for people to actually at least be honest about where they might actually agree. Um, because I think what we, what we actually see now is that there's, I'm not even going to admit that maybe we should take down Robert E. Lee, or I'm not even going to admit that maybe a face mask is okay. Or I'm not going to admit, you know what I mean? Because we are afraid that if we admit that, then the next thing you know, Washington DC is going to be renamed, you know, something else. Mm -hmm. Um, then I think the second piece is because once we identify that the worry is not about this particular statue, but what meaning this particular statue means for a whole host of other things, then that gives us something we could discuss and negotiate about. Um, 
And that's going to be another series of hard conversations. But you can imagine negotiating a whole set of mutually agreeable criteria by which we would make these decisions going forward. Um, and that, and I don't know what it's going to be, right? I think, I think that, um, I think what doesn't work is for the other side to say, you know, don't worry, no one's ever going to want to, you know, rename Washington, D.C. Um, I think if you're Why on the Why doesn't others, that work? Because I think right now the trust on both sides is so low that I don't believe you. Hmm. Um, well, that brings so, up an interesting point because like, you know, in a lot of these cases, the trust should be low. You know, a lot yeah. of the reasons that they're coming forward and saying, I remember to take an example that I remember, you know, studying with you was around abortion laws and how, um, you know, somebody would propose a law that would protect a fetus like from, like, you know, if you, at if you attacked a pregnant woman and, and, and hurt or killed the fetus, like that would be, you know, you could be punished for that. And yeah. like, that's like totally reasonable. But of course, like people who believe in, you know, pro-choice, like don't want to can see right through the reason that you're doing that is because you want to, you know, in that way, you know, in, give a, a foothold or a basis for not allowing abortion. Like, yeah. The, and so it's not like it's like a, an unwarranted fear of a slippery slope when that's the direction that you're trying to move the football. Right. Like, or, yeah. um, you know, yes, I agree. I mean, I mean, and I think that, but that, that's why the, I think there's a lot of progress if someone can at least say what you, what you just said, which is, I don't think the thing you're asking for is outrageous. I'm worried that it's going to lead to the thing you're asking for plus two. Right. Um, and so, and then the answer is like, yes, that's where I want to go. Right. So and so we're... great. Yeah, so great. So that's where we want to go. So, so then here's the thing. Like, I'm prepared to have an ag negotiate an agreement with you that we can go to X. Um, but, I, you know, I want to draw the line at X plus two. Um, and I want to frame this in ways that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get counted as a precedent for or doesn't have meaning for the following different, different ways. Because otherwise we can't move forward on anything, right? It can't be the case that either, you know, just to use the statutes example, right? That um, we're gonna have a 2020 litmus test for every single statute that was put up in this country. And if it doesn't meet the 2020, how you're supposed to be a 2020, your statute's coming down. Um, I don't think, I. I, I you're going to get by if that if that's the situation. I don't think you're going to get buy-in on that, right? So there have to be a set of things we can negotiate where we're not where we can where and where our underlying interests are actually met in some way, right? So, so for example, um, and this is where also I think Gene, you can suss out people who have legitimate interests and people who are saying something, but it really isn't legitimate. Like, so for example, <laughs> to the degree that remembering our history and uh, making sure that that doesn't get lost is a legitimate interest. There's a, all sorts of creative ways that people can do that. And in fact, have done that. Um, I think about the, you know, the seal uh, the thing that used to be the seal of Harvard Law School up until a few right, I remember years you ago. told about talked about this in the last episode. Yeah, I mean that's just an example, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I think we could be creative about those those things. On the other hand, then, and this is what the beauty of going from you know positions to interests. If the interest is around history, and every single creative idea we come up with gets negated, then you know what I think. You're not here in good faith. So then what, ha then what happens is I, I ended up spending, I'm just making up the amount of time, whatever, an additional five hours of time um, to discover that you're not in good faith. You know what? I actually think that's a good investment of time. 
because I think other people who are watching that negotiation or watching that set of interactions will see how much I tried to work with you. They'll see that I was genuine and sincere. Um, and that's going to actually create capital for me. And for those for whom it was a legitimate interest, they'll be happy. And for those who are just kind of using that as an excuse, they end up getting exposed. As opposed to if I immediately dismiss you and take the opposite viewpoint, that like I just might be missing a lot there. Well, you know, it might not be that they're not there in good faith. It just might be that they don't fully understand their own um, basis for why they feel that way. Because I, I had this conversation, unfortunately, through social media with somebody about the monuments. Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, if, and they were like, you're trying to erase history. And I was like, well, okay, like, if that's the concern, like, we could be creative, we could do museums, there's all sorts of ways of remembering history. And by the way, like, isn't the statue itself erasing history because it's glorifying somebody who is brutal and treasonous and, you know, like, so let's like, let's, you know, I totally hear you on why history is important. Let's be creative about that. And like, well, no, it's not about that. It's, it's a slippery slope about like, where do you stop? If you do it for him, do you get, to, well, okay, like I can stipulate with you that we'll stop at X and not X plus two. We'll stop at, you know, Robert E. Lee, but we'll keep the, the Washington and the Jefferson monuments up in, in DC. And then like, no, it's not, so, and what you really, what I was kind of feeling again is like that they just didn't like me being like this, you know, Northeast liberal, you know, wanting to impose my yeah. values on them. Like they're yeah. not going to say that and they might not even fully understand it themselves. And I might not fully understand my own feelings about why I feel, you know, there's certain like things that I'm sure that I don't understand on my end, but maybe through that, like you can kind of fully understand that fear of like where they're coming from or where we're coming from. Yeah. And but I on the think, slippery slope thing, like, sorry to interrupt, go ahead. No, no, I mean, I was going to use your example. I mean, just to say I'm, I'm part of that conversation, right? There's two things I'm thinking about. One is, I think there's a value um, if the, that person keeps on moving from issue to issue, where they might actually come away thinking like, yeah, like there really isn't much basis. Um, but the second thing I want to say on that is whether they come away feeling a, there isn't much basis, or B, that they were interrogated, has a lot to do with kind of the tone and the way you frame these questions. Mm. Yeah, and I probably messed that up. I'm not saying you did, but I think, if, <laughs> I, but, I mean, I have certainly, and, and everybody has, because it's because we're prone to. Um, but I think in the most skillful articulation of this, we're making these moves, um, where in a way we we may be showing to the other side that the things they thought were the reasons don't really add up but we're doing it in a way that isn't arrogant or antagonistic uh, we're doing it in a way that um actually conveys like like a, a, sh a shared sense of both of us because we all all of us in the universe believe in certain things or hold on to certain things that we haven't really thought all that hard about. And yeah, like when we, when we come to that, that also feels disruptive. It feels disorienting. Um, we want to cling on to the things that we were told. And I, if I'm on, if I'm on the, uh, if I'm in a conversation where some I could see someone is feeling those things, right? I'm not there to like seal the deal or show them how they're wrong. I'm kind of there like, yeah, like there's probably 15 other things or 500 other things that I kind of hold pretty non-thinkingly. And yeah, what would you think about coming back in a few weeks when we both have a time, to, a chance to kind of think more about these and maybe we could talk again. Hmm. That's an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Hmm. Sorry, but you're going to ask me something. Oh, so I was just going to ask on the slippery slope thing again. Like, what if, like, you don't want to preempt, like, a future negotiating point by, like, giving it away and saying, okay, look, like, all right, I understand, like, 
I don't know what a good example is. Um, let's take gay marriage, for example. Right. And people right. say like, all right, um, I don't really have a problem with gay people being get, getting married, but I don't want to have to, you know, I don't want my church to have to marry them. Right. Like I don't want, I'm a baker and I don't want to have to bake a cake for a gay wedding. Mm -hmm. So like, would you, but like really like, you know, you believe in equal rights for everybody and like that businesses shouldn't be allowed to like discriminate based off of that, of, you know, sexual orientation or like, I, I don't want to have to, you know, hire somebody uh, based, you know, on who's gay because I'm a, I'm a, a religious institution and it's against my religion. Yeah. But like you don't want to give that chip away by saying like, you you do want to go down that slippery slope. So you don't want to like say I'm not going to go to X plus two because I do want to go to X plus two. Right. Yeah. I mean, again, like I I get that from a negotiation strategy. Um, I think though what it what it really ends up doing. I mean, in some sense, what I want to say to that is there's a battle to be fought. So we could either fight the battle on the thing we actually all agree with, which I would say actually makes you look weaker. And, or we could, when we get to the area where we disagree, we could have the battle on those merits. Mm -hmm. And at least you'll have some merit, right? I mean, because I think they're, they're, you know, I'm just using your example, right? Arguably, I mean, I guess it's arguable, but I think that, there is a stronger argument that would get a lot more sympathy around whether a church, for example, um, should be forced to bless a, a same-sex marriage because in our country we um, have enshrined freedom of religion mm -hmm. than whether an individual and their right to marry someone should be infringed upon. So you're now, not you, but you know, someone on the other side, you're saying, I'm going to fight the fight on a right that I think you should have, actually makes you, kind of you look worse. Like, I, fight the fight on the thing that you actually really feel about. Um, that frankly, like, I think many people might, be, might agree with you on. Um, hmm. But I mean, I get it. Like, listen, I think slip, I mean, slippery slope arguments are powerful barriers to negotiated agreement for the reasons why you're saying. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that it's crazy to worry about this, but I think what's happened and when it's happening more and more, and I mean, it goes to something, you know, we mentioned earlier, because there is a bigger and bigger reduction in trust around the goodwill and integrity of the other side, we have seen people stake out more and more extreme views. Um, because I'm afraid, I don't trust that when we get to the conversation about religious organizations, that you will accord the argument or grant the argument that there is something different about religious expression. Whether you agree with me on the substantive matter or not, just that you'll grant that there's something different. I'm afraid you're not going to grant that as like a matter of like constitutional fact or normative fact. Um, therefore, so I... I'm going to stake out the most extreme possible position I can right now. Mm -hmm. In the same way, I mean, the abortion argument is a really good example of that. Uh, on the pro-life side, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the, fray, the argument that the second two cells have combined, that that is a human life um, because then maybe I can, you know, win the day that when the baby is, or, is five or six months uh, in the womb, that that will count. And you're going to take the opposite view. You're going to say that until the baby is born, it's not a human life. Because we're both afraid to at least say that there is a, and most Americans actually think, a really big difference between 
abort an early term and a late term abortion. But the sides, the, the partisans on that argument, on, who are on that battlefront, will never admit that. They'll just never admit that. Mm-hmm. And I think like a lot is being lost, and and it, it's being lost. I would say um, around all sorts of good things that could happen if we put that argument aside and say, you know, how do we support women around their choices, right? Hmm. Um, you know, I think I think yeah. an example that happened in this election cycle on the Democratic side that I found pretty interesting um, is that, you know, the longstanding um, plank of the Democratic Party was that abortion should be safe, legal, and rare. Right. Um, and when Tulsi Gabbard suggested that in a debate, she was, you know, practically booed off the stage as having like this really retro opinion. Um, <laughs> And I thought, I don't think that helps Democrats one bit. Um, right. But well, somehow, there's, so go ahead, sorry. I say some of what I think is, and some, certain things are kind of like, you know, synapses are firing together. It's like, it's maybe underlying a lot of the things that, we, that you've brought up and we've talked about in this conversation is trust. And like, how do you, you can't have these conversations if you, if there's not that trust there. And it's really hard to have that trust there if your intentions aren't at least understood and, and you yeah. can't trust each other's intentions. Like if you think that I'm yeah. coming into this conversation just to persuade you and we're not going to trust each other, and we're not going to trust each other. Yeah. And, I mean, I think, you know, yeah. trust is like something that, you can't build in that moment. You can't just sit down and like establish trust in that moment. It's, it's got to be built way, way, way in advance. And it just seems like so many of the things that are going on are just eroding trust and yeah. making it a lot di- more difficult to have these conversations and build these bridges. And, you know, I'm not sure like, you know, you've spoken a little bit about conflict resilience, which is a, a new term for me back in my day when I was studying with you was, this transition from conflict resolution to conflict management. Now I guess it's gone to conflict resilience. But you know, when I think of resilience, like resilience is not something that you can develop at the moment that you need it. You've got to develop it way in advance. That's exactly you've to, right. You've got to like make yourself resilient by training it over time, training yourself over time to be resilient. Yeah. Um, so yeah. how are you like, how, how are you, is, is that, am I kind of hitting, coming into like the right area about conflict resilience and trust? Is, is that yeah, kind of so I think, I think your point on trust is exactly right. And it kind of almost brings us full circle, right? About why have these conversations at all? Right. Because I think that when our stance is a stance to learn, one of the byproducts of the conversation is that it increases the likelihood that we could actually have some trust in the other side, trust in their integrity, trust that they're not just some unidimensional cartoon character. Um, We get to know them in a deeper way. And I think that um, if we can kind of build that reservoir of kind of trust, a sense of basic kind of decency and integrity, um, it, it opens up our capacity to work with each other, even on the areas where we disagree. And maybe that that is um, kind of helps me kind of introduce this idea of conflict resilience. So that's a pretty new term that I've I've kind of been coining. I mean, it's not really out there. <laughs> I've okay. written I've written an article on it, and I'm doing more writing on it. Um, and I think it is on the one hand nothing new under the sun. On the other hand, I think it is quite different uh, because I think of of conflict resilience as the um, it is both an intention or a capacity as well as a set of skills. And specifically, it is that capacity to be in the presence of others with whom we have deeply held differences, to be able to assert our viewpoint with authenticity so, and, and strength, 
but in a way that the other can actually hear. And also to be able to listen to and be curious um, about the other. And I think that this quality is uh, a quality that honestly, in the, since you've graduated from Harvard Law School, <laughs> Um, over the past 20 years in American life ha is being lost. Hmm. And I think it's really dangerous. I think the way it's being lost is that, I mean, just to go back to, you know, what we were talking about earlier is um, we have pretty thin skins now. As soon as there's a conflict or a difference, we unfriend you, we distract ourselves, we change the topic. Or the other model we have is we get into a ginormous battle. Um, and neither of those are conflict resilience, right? Um, conflict resilience is that, is really kind of having this ability, and I agree with you, your framing about it is right. It's something that you really have to train for over time to sit with discomfort, right? And that's something that's being really talked about now in this moment around race in this country. Yeah, like this is uncomfortable and it won't end after the next hour. Um, it won't end in 10 minutes. It won't end in two months. And yeah, it's gotta get used to it. You gotta get like, it's gonna be uncomfortable because we're, we're relearning and unlearning a lot. Um, and I think that the American taste for discomfort um, across the board has gotten really reduced. I was at a talk um, some months ago oh. on opioids and the speaker was talking about how there's a way that we wanna blame the pharmaceutical companies for opioid opioid addiction. And mm -hmm. certainly they are, you know, uh, have a culpable culpability to them. But right. you, know where, you know where else, you know where they got their business from? The American people. Because you know why? People didn't want to feel pain after surgery, right? I don't want to feel any pain at all. Make it go away. Um, there's a market right now for making pain go away. Sure. Across the board. Yeah, and I that's ultimately think what like, it's, this brings together so many of the different interviews that I've done, whether it's with Joe DeSena, the founder of Spartan Race, Mir Ayal, who wrote a book called Indistractable, which is all about how, you know, like, and Hooked, which is how social media and like all of our digital products tap into that discomfort to addict us. And well, he wouldn't say addict us, but to hook us. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Same thing like, and Kristen Ulmer, Big Mountain Skier, who writes about fear and how we basically, all the things that we do are to basically distract ourselves from our discomfort. And we just can't sit with that discomfort. Yeah. People really don't like that discomfort. They'll do anything yeah. to avoid it. Yes. Yes. And I think what conflict resilience is, is entering into conflict that will not be resolved at the end of our conversation today or next week that will maybe keep us up a bit at night. Um, that's really authentic where our, you know, our experience is really put forward. Um, but we're also, we're really listening to the other side. That's it. Hmm. And I think that quality takes a lot of training. I think it's really hard. And I think people basically don't want to do it. We're losing it. And I think we need to get it. Hmm. Well, there's a lot I could ask you about that, but we've gone a long ways already. We've gone long. We've, yeah, we've gone, we've gone long. long. Maybe, um, maybe it's time to it's for us interesting. to- Definitely would love to continue, continue your thoughts on that sometime. But Bob, this has been amazing. I'm sure that this one is, pe people are going to like this one as much as they love the last one. You've given us all a lot to think about and I really, really appreciate it. Gene, my pleasure. Um, thanks so much for having me again and um, looking, looking forward to hearing the reaction from it. Maybe we'll do a trilogy. Right. I'm, I'm down <laughs> for that. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Thanks everyone yeah, out yeah, there for walking well. with us. Every mile matters.